Exodus chapter 14. The Israelites are out of Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. And today we're going to take a look at one of the most famous stories in the Bible. As with all of the stories in the Bible, this one actually happened. If you grew up in the church, you've heard this story at least a hundred times. If you didn't grow up in the church, you may even know the story from pop culture. And if you're really old, you may have seen this depicted in the old movie, The Ten Commandments, which of course was filmed back when dinosaurs ruled the earth. And we're going to deal with a little bit of, of nerdy information up front because there's a massive question we have to address at this point in Exodus, and then we'll get into some real practical application for our lives from the text. So let's jump in at Exodus chapter 14, verse 1 in your Bibles. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Pi Hahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land and the wilderness has closed them in. So if you'll take a look now at the map that was included with your bulletin and outline, I want to explain just a little bit about Israel's current situation in our study. Numbers 33 also gives an account of Israel's movements during the exodus out of Egypt. And it tells us that the place they gathered in Egypt, sort of their staging area right before they left Egypt, was uh, the city of Ramses, or Ramesses, which was one of those supply cities mentioned in Exodus 1, one of those big uh, federal infrastructure projects that the Israeli slaves were tasked with building. It was the city of Ramses. At the Lord's command, the Is Israelites left Egypt, they headed southeast, and then God told Moses to lead the children of Israel back north to Pihahiroth. Pharaoh inevitably has scouts watching Israel's movements. And so this weird turn back north is one of the reasons Pharaoh thinks, man, these guys are already lost. They have no idea what they're doing. The other reason Pharaoh thinks that is because Israel has now camped in front of a large body of water with terrain on either side that makes turning to the right or the left impossible. We don't know if it was a valley. We don't know if there were mountains, ravines. We just know that they couldn't go to the right or the left. The only way they could go was straight into the water, which wasn't going to happen, or they could turn around and go back, or so Pharaoh thought. This leads to one of the most frequently asked questions about the book of Exodus. It's a question about this chapter, Exodus chapter 14. And I don't think I'm spoiling the story for anyone when I tell you that Israel is going to miraculously make it across this body of water. If I am, if I just ruined it, I'm so sorry. But this story is still going to be a great journey. So the question is, where did Israel cross the Red Sea? Where did Israel cross the Red Sea? People have made careers out of claiming to figure this out. And this week I have listened to and read an incredible amount of boring information so that I can share with you the most credible information in the most concise manner possible. If for some reason, you want all the extra details and you want to know all of my sources, I'd be happy to share them with you after the service. But please know it's just Bible nerd stuff. It's going to have absolutely no impact on your faith. It's not going to grow your relationship with the Lord in any way. So let's take a look at some stuff here. The first major issue we run into with this question is that the term translated in your Bible, Red Sea, is the Hebrew term Sufyam. Sufyam. Sounds like a Hebrew fast food takeout place. Sufyam. And it actually means sea of reeds or sea of papyrus reeds. Now in Exodus 13 and 15, the body of water we're talking about today is referred to as the Red Sea most of the time. But here in Exodus 14, where they actually cross it, it's simply referred to as the sea. And sea is the word yam of Sufyam. And it's used to refer to an ocean, a sea, a lake, a river, basically any large body of water that was significant. So the first question is, why is this body of water sometimes called the Red Sea in the book of Exodus, and other times it's just called the sea? How, how can it be the Red Sea, but also not be the Red Sea, just be a sea at the same time? And why would it be called the Sea of Reeds when reeds don't grow in salt water? Is it possible for that to happen? Additionally, Archaeology has discovered with absolute certainty the locations of Ramses, Sukkoth, 
and Etham, the first three points of Israel's journey in the Exodus. And here's what we know. We know that they're all west of the Gulf of Suez, if you want to look at your maps. You'll see that the Gulf of Suez comes up from the Red Sea and forms the western border of the Sinai Peninsula. When you factor that with the biblical narrative, here's what we can say with certainty. We can say for sure that the Israelites are nowhere near the Gulf of Aqaba. The Gulf of Aqaba is the other prong that comes up from the Red Sea on the bottom of your pages, the one that goes on the eastern side of the Sinai Peninsula. So anyone, okay, anyone who tries to tell you that Israel crossed the Red Sea on the eastern side of the Sinai Peninsula, that they went across anywhere near the Gulf of Aqaba, is completely ignoring what the Bible says and what we now know as historical fact. I don't care how convincing their YouTube video is. I don't care if there's a land bridge picked up in satellite photos. I don't care. The Bible says that's not where it happened. We know that for sure. The problem is that we don't know the exact locations of any of the stops on the other side of the sea till they're well into their journey. So in case you're thinking, okay, well, if we know what was on this side of the sea, then why don't we just see what was on the other side of the sea and draw a straight line? It's because we, we don't know about the next six or seven stops that they went on. We don't know exactly where they are. That's why if you look at your map, places like Migdal, Mara, and Elam all have a question mark next to their name because those are our best guesses where they are. And as I mentioned a moment ago, Numbers 33 lists the cities Israel journeyed through in the Exodus. And there's a problem in Numbers 33 too, because here's how it describes their travels. Let's see if we can spot the problem. It's on your outlines if you want to follow along, and I'll have you underline two things. It says, then the children of Israel moved from Ramesses and camped at Sukkoth. They departed from Sukkoth and camped at Etham, which is on the edge of the wilderness. They moved from Etham and turned back, back north, to Pihahiroth, which is east of Baal Zephon, and they camped near Migdal. They departed from before Hahiroth and passed through the midst of the sea. Passed through the midst of the sea, underline that, into the wilderness. That's the sea crossing right there. They went three days' journey in the wilderness of Etham and camped at Mara. They moved from Mara and came to Elam. At Elam were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there. Now get this. They moved from Elam and camped by, what does it say? The Red Sea. The Red Sea. Do you see the problem there in Numbers 33? Whatever the sea that Israel miraculously crossed over was, Numbers 33 has them doing it well before they reached the Red Sea. They crossed over the sea, then they went through a whole bunch of places, then they came to the Red Sea. What do you do with that? Well, here's the best explanation I found that amalgamates all of this information. Back at this time in history, it turns out there was almost certainly, if you want to look at your maps, a system of canals joining several lakes together all the way if you go from the northernmost point of the Gulf of Suez. So you find the top of the Gulf of Suez, and if you go north, you will see there's some lakes there. There was almost certainly a system of canals built by the Egyptians that connected the Gulf of Suez to the Mediterranean Sea up north and connected all the lakes in between. And incredibly, they took aerial photos in the 1970s, archaeologists did, and they were still able to pick up historical traces of this system of canals cut into the land. They could still see it. They were all, they're pretty much all dried up, and several of the lakes around there have dried up in the meantime. But what's also interesting is that the name Pihahiroth almost certainly means mouth of the canals. It means mouth of the canals. And that would explain why this body of water is considered the Red Sea, but also kind of considered not the Red Sea. Because technically it's connected to the Red Sea, but it is not actually the Red Sea proper. There would have been a mixture of salt and fresh water, because inevitably it would have got some fresh water runoff from the Nile Delta and places like that. And this would have made the water brackish and made it possible for reeds to grow. So when you look at all of the data, Israel was likely camped in front of a relatively large lake that was located somewhere between the northernmost point of the Gulf of Suez and the Mediterranean Sea and connected to both via a system of canals. And this lake would have been big enough that simply going around it was not an option because of the terrain and the depth of the lake. Now this doesn't lessen the miracle 
in any way because we're going to find out that wherever this body of water was, it was deep enough to drown the Egyptian army. So let me just put that out there up front as well. When people say, well, maybe it was just a marsh and, and it was a little bit boggy. Maybe it wasn't really that deep and so God caused there to be a, you know, a drought so the water wasn't that deep. The, the problem with that is you can say, well, okay, if you want to do it, that's fine because then it's even more miraculous because God managed to drown the entire Egyptian army in four inches of water, which is pretty incredible. So there's just no way around it. We're going to find that the text makes it impossible to dismiss the supernatural aspect of this miracle. It had to be a miracle for all these things to happen. So with that taken care of, let's get back to our story in verse 4. God continues speaking to Moses and he says, Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, pursue the Israelites, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. We talked about this in earlier messages that, that Pharaoh hardened his own heart stubbornly and repeatedly in the face of overwhelming evidence and because Pharaoh was never going to repent and serve God, he reached a point where God said, okay, now, now because you won't repent, I will make it so you can't repent. And now I'm going to use you as a pawn in my story to bring glory to my name. And that's totally reasonable on God's part. It's totally fair because Pharaoh had rejected a mountain of evidence. He was never going to turn to the Lord. God did not take away his choice. He had already made his choice and was never going to change his mind. The Egyptian army, you need to know too, was the best in the world. By a long shot at this time in history. You've got to think sort of what the American military was like in the 90s compared to the other military services around the world. The Egyptians essentially invented the chariot and so they were viewed as having the most advanced military tech of the day. They were light years ahead of everyone else and their military was viewed as absolutely unstoppable. The best parallel we can give was Egypt's chariots were, were so superior it was like one army having tanks and the other army riding horses. That's the sort of difference we're talking about. Let's continue in verse 5. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, oh, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? Now this has to be the Lord hardening their hearts, right? Because their reaction makes no sense. They're literally still mourning the deaths of every firstborn son in Egypt, which was the 10th plague that God had sent upon them. But now they're going to ask each other, why did, why did we let them go again? What were we thinking? What were we thinking? The Egyptians suddenly realize at the prompting of God that there will be devastating economic consequences for their country if they let their 600,000 man slave labor force flee. Their whole pyramid scheme is going to collapse. They're going to lose their whole downline. Their whole downline, terrible. We know we didn't, they didn't build the pyramids. I expected an affectionate boo, Dave. I'm a little offended by that. So verse 6, so he, Pharaoh, made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. So notice what the text actually says. It says 600 of these chariots were basically elite but we don't know the total number of chariots that went. All we know is that in addition to those 600, it was all the chariots in Egypt. The whole army goes out. Verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. That, that word boldness is such a weird translation. It really should be translated as rejoicing. All it's saying there is that they went out chasing the Israelites and the Israelites had left Egypt rejoicing. We're free, we're free, we're free. And now the Egyptian army is coming for them. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth before Baal Zephon. So the Egyptians aren't actively fighting the Israelites yet, but they've got them pinned down. They've got them trapped against this large body of water with nowhere to go. And you've got to remember, the Israelites are basically unarmed. They have no fighting force, no fighting skills, nothing. They're completely defenseless. Verse 10, and when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They actually get their first reaction right. They cried out to the Lord. That's good. That's a good, godly, right reaction. 
Unfortunately, they didn't wait for God to respond. They cried out to the Lord and then turned straight to complaining. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? And so we need to be careful here because we read the Exodus story and we see the big picture, right? We know the miracle that's coming. We know where this whole thing is going. And so we look at the situation and we think, faithless Israelites, shame on you, shame on you. Do you not remember all that the Lord did for you in Egypt? All the miracles? Disappointing. But they're all thinking, uh, yeah, we do, we do. But none of that matters right now because apparently, as great as God is, he's a terrible navigator because he has led us into a dead-end situation and now we've got a ticked-off Egyptian army closing in on us and they're going to kill a bunch of us to teach us a lesson, they're going to torture a bunch of us to teach us a lesson, and then they're going to take us back to Egypt as slaves and treat us worse than ever before. So yes, we remember everything, but what does that have to do with what's happening right now? We've seen the Lord move in our lives many times, haven't we? We've seen miracles. We've seen the faithfulness of God over and over and over. And yet sometimes we respond to a crisis in a very, very similar manner to these Israelites, don't we? Yes, Lord, I, I know you've always been faithful in the past, but, but none of that None of that matters right now because right now I'm in a crisis and, and if you're such a good God, then why am I even in this situation? I mean, I know you would never react like that. This is for our online listeners, of course, but we tend to naturally be so slow to remember the faithfulness of God. That's one of the reasons we need to worship God as a daily practice, as a daily habit. Why? Because we need daily reminders that God has always been and will always be faithful. That's why we sing about the faithfulness and the greatness of God in this church so much. There's a reason we sing the kind of songs we do because we need those reminders. We need to remember. We need the opportunity to take communion and remember that God is faithful even when it costs him his life. He's faithful, always. And when our faith is failing, when we're freaking out in a crisis, we love to engage in revisionist history, which is what the Israelites are starting to do as we read on in verse 12. They continue saying to Moses, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Really? So their claim is, listen, Moses, you showed up. We were doing just fine in Egypt. We told you we didn't even want to go. We told you we should stay. We foresaw things going badly if we left, which is a little bit different to what Exodus 2.23 told us. It's on your outlines. You might recall right near the beginning of the story, it says, then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. Revisionist history. I tried putting God first in my finances and my dishwasher died that same month. So much for the faithfulness of God. I knew it was a bad idea. I knew it didn't make sense. I tried honoring the Lord at my job and I still got fired when my company downsized. Why did I even bother trying to do things God's way? I knew I should have just been sandbagging it the whole time. I'm trying to honor God in my marriage, but my spouse isn't changing. It's obvious God's ways don't work. As I knew, as I knew, could have told you that years ago. What are we really saying when we talk like that? What are we really saying? I want to suggest that what we're really saying is, I expected that obeying God would result in immediate, tangible benefits in my life. I expected it to pay off really, really fast. And when that didn't happen... I didn't really see any reason to continue obeying the Lord. Please hear me on this. Yes, there are incredible benefits, incredible blessings to living the Lord's way, often in this life, but not always in this life. And here's what I don't want you to miss or ever be confused about as a Christian. The reason we obey the Lord is because we love the Lord. Would you write that down? The reason we obey the Lord is because we love the Lord. 
We have not struck some sort of reverse Faustian bargain with God where we will obey God if in return he blesses our lives. That's not the way this works. Jesus said, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things I say? In other words, Jesus was saying, if you obey me, it's because I'm your Lord. I'm your master. I'm your God. We love the Lord, and he's our Lord. That's why we obey him first and foremost. Not because we think it's always going to result in immediate, tangible benefits to us. Do you know what the greatest benefit is of serving God? Eternal life. Eternal life. May we never look back at our life before Jesus and engage in revisionist history and think, man, things were so much better before I began following the Lord. Because they weren't. They weren't. I don't care what kind of tricks your mind is playing on you. Your life was not better. We were dead in our sins. We were incapable of perceiving true reality. We had no idea what was actually going on in the world. We were living absolutely meaningless lives, devoting every ounce of our sweat and energy and effort to emotion and emotions to things and causes that are going to fade away as soon as our earthly life is over. We were destined to vainly pursue one disappointing life goal after another, and every time we achieved it, realizing it was not what we were hoping it would be. We were enemies of God. So yes, it would be better to die in the wilderness as a friend of God than live as a slave in Egypt outside of the family of God. It would be better. Verse 13, and Moses said to the people, now underline this, almost this whole thing, 13 and 14, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation, the deliverance of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians, I love this, for the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. And you shall hold your peace. In other words, you will be quiet. Moses said, guys, listen up. I know you're freaking out. I know you think it'd be better if we were in Egypt. But I got a three-step plan. Listen closely. You cried out to the Lord. That was a good start. But you needed to go on to the next three steps. Step one, he said, do not be afraid. Perhaps one of the most neglected instructions in all of Scripture. It appears dozens of times throughout the Bible. And the thing you most need to know about the phrase, do not be afraid, is that it is not a suggestion in Scripture. It is a command. Not a suggestion, it's a command. When fear tries to pop into our minds for a visit, God says you are not to invite him in. You are not to put on the kettle, make him a cup of tea and say, what do you want to talk about today? You are not to do that when fear comes knocking at the door of your life and in your mind. We are to focus our thoughts on God's faithfulness, God's promises, and God's word. Fear is not to be welcomed. It's not to be entertained. It's not to be hosted in our lives. This is a big deal to our heavenly father because fear indicates it reveals a lack of trust. It reveals a lack of faith in the character of our Heavenly Father. It indicates we don't actually believe that He's good. We don't actually believe that He cares about us. As we know, faith is everything in the Christian life. It's a big deal, and that's why God commands us to not be afraid. Would you write this down? Faith and fear are mutually exclu exclusive. Faith and fear are are mutually exclusive. If you're involved in one, you're not going to be involved in the other. Secondly, part two of the plan, stand still or hold your peace. The Israelites were still baby believers at this point. They were a whole nation of baby Christians. They were young in their faith. And so through Moses, God said, I understand that you guys don't know how to speak faith yet. I understand that you don't have the promises of God stored up in your hearts. So if you can't speak faith, then would you just shut up? 
Would you just shut up? Because saying nothing is better than speaking doubt and fear. That's what God was saying. If you can't speak faith, then just shut up. And the phrase stand still applies to more than just our speech. It means stop running around in a panic. Stop acting crazy. When you're in a situation where you can't change anything, when you're in a situation where the problem is somebody else's heart, you can't change their heart. When you're in a situation where it's an illness, you don't have the power to snap your fingers and fix it. When it's a situation beyond your control, stand still means stop acting crazy. Stop acting like there's something you can do when you know there's nothing you can do to fix this. Stop trying to act as though doing more stuff is going to help. You got to picture God the Father putting his hands on your shoulder and saying, I need you just to sit down, take a minute and just chill, okay? But, 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 shh, shh, shh. Sit down. Just be still for a little bit. That's what God is saying. So write this down. If you can't say anything faith-filled, then don't say anything at all. If you can't say anything faith-filled, then don't say anything at all. We're going to see this still. God's still teaching them this lesson. Next generation, when they go into the promised land, first city they run into, Jericho, God says march around it. You remember what God says they're to do while they march around it? Shut up. Don't say anything. You know why? Because what are they going to be saying? This is the stupidest thing ever. I can't believe we're power walking every day for a whole week and somehow this is supposed to be a military strategy. What are we doing? Do you see the people up there laughing at us? So God says, mm, mm, mm. Shh, shh. don't say anything. If you can't speak faith, then just be quiet. That'll do for now. And then thirdly, see the salvation of the Lord and the Lord will fight for you. As you cast out fear, as you focus on the Lord's promises, as you recall his past faithfulness, as you cast your cares upon him, as you share your needs with him, as you rest in him, rather than run around like a chicken with its head cut off, pay attention to what he does. You've cried out to him. You are being still. You are casting out fear, choosing to not speak doubt. Now just wait. Just wait. When you've given it to the Lord, leave it in the Lord's hand. Don't be like, Lord, I'm leaving this in your hands. Okay, that's long enough. I'll take it back now. Put it in his hands and then just wait. Wait and see what he does. Pay attention. Why? Because he's going to do something. And if you're paying attention, then maybe next time you'll remember what you saw him do this time. And you'll actually begin to trust him proactively you'll actually begin to speak faith build faith and I just love that phrase the Lord will fight for you I love that Moses tells him that the Lord will fight for you write this down pay attention to what the Lord does after you trust him pay attention expect that he's actually going to respond in some way and when you put all this together you get a good picture of exactly how much we contribute to God's work in our lives what's our part Well, we need to believe what he says. We need to shut up and stay out of his way and take note of what he does. That's our contribution. It's about as much as we contribute to our salvation. We believe what he says, we shut up and stay out of his way, and we take note of what he does, and then we praise him for it. Thank you, Lord, for doing this in my life. Verse 15, and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Can you imagine Moses at this moment? Forward where? But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Oh, why didn't I think of that? And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And the angel of God, remember that's Jesus, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud, we learned last week, that's the Shekinah glory of God, the visible manifestation of God's glory. But I want to just point this out before we go on. Did you catch that it said and, the word and? So verse 19, just for you Bible nerds, it mentions the angel of God and the pillar of cloud which clearly tells us that they were visible as two separate 
entities to the Israelites, just as they were in the burning bush with Moses. Just a point of interest for those of you who are interested in such things. Then it says, the pillar went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. So both Jesus and the Shekinah glory of God, the presence of God in the form of the pillar of cloud and fire, moved from the front where they were leading Israel to the rear so that they could protect Israel. They changed from guide to guardian in order to meet Israel's need of the moment. And this is what the God who calls himself I am, I am that I am, does. He meets your need moment to moment. He's peace when you need it. He's hope when you need it. He's strength when you need it. He's rest when you need it. He's protection when you need it. He's everything. He's everything we need. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, to the Egyptians, and it gave light by night to the other, to the Israelites, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So the cloud of God's glory and the angel of the Lord, they divide the Israelis from the Egyptians that night. It's sort of burning with fire on one side and giving light and warmth to the Israelis and it's plunging the Egyptians into total darkness on the other side and the implication is that the Egyptians could not and wouldn't dare to even try and move through the cloud because they knew something's going on, something's going on. Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. Now just a quick observation because we we have this story so ingrained in our heads for most of us, but read what the verse we just read actually says. It does not describe the sea parting as an instantaneous event. Did you see that? He didn't just raise it and whoop. That's not what happened. It says Moses raises his staff over the sea, And it would seem to imply that I don't think Moses stands there all night. I think he likely goes to bed and goes to sleep. And then it says that God caused a strong east wind to blow all that night. All that night. So this wind is so strong that that the next morning when the Israelis wake up, the seabed in front of them in this body of water, this lake, was, was just dry land. And these winds are holding back the waters on either side, creating this straight path through the water. Verse 22, so the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground. It's dry ground. It's not even muddy. It's dry. And the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. So again, if you want to attribute this to some sort of natural causes, you want to say, oh, it's a river and God blocked it further upstream. Oh, it was a thin, narrow place. You got a real problem with what the text says in verse 22 because it does not describe the water level dropping in a uniform manner as water always behaves. It describes the waters being stopped, being held in place so that they are like a wall, it says, on either side of the dry ground that the Israelis walk through. It was a legitimate, mind-blowing miracle. And, And to claim otherwise, you have to claim that the text is lying. Verse 23, and the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. So again, just a note for you Bible nerds, that verse, verse 24, is telling us that God was present in the pillar of fire and cloud. And he troubled or confused the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So imagine the scene. You're an Egyptian soldier and you're, you're driving your chariot through the seabed. You can look on your left and on your right and you can see the walls of water in place. And, and that's freaky enough to begin with. And then weird things start happening. Chariot wheels start falling off. The ground begins to become muddy and chariots start getting stuck. Psalm 77, 16 through 19 seems to suggest that God sent rain, lightning, thunder and an earthquake upon the Egyptians as they pass through the sea in pursuit of the Israelites. So you see all this, the ground is shaking, the water's right there, you know that it's enough to drown you and you're starting to get a really, really bad feeling. And so you ditch your horse and your chariot and you just run for your life, but it's too late. Verse 26, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth 
while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. Wherever the Israelis crossed the Sea of Reeds, it was a miracle. It was an absolute, absolute miracle because when God released the waters, they came on with a force and a depth that was enough to drown every single soldier in the Egyptian army. Every single one. Verse 29, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. They're washing up. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. There's the change. I want to draw your attention to this. There's the change. That last phrase, it says that they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. You see, after this, they didn't just believe in God. Now they believed God. They didn't just believe that God existed. Now they're starting to believe what God said. Many people believe in God, but a lot less believe God. And the Lord was working here and will continue to work in the lives of the Israelis as he does in us to get us to the place where we believe him. We don't just believe in him, but we actually believe him. Would you write this down? God wants to grow believers from believing in him to believing him. It's a very different thing. He wants to grow believers from believing in him to believing him. Two quick notes on this chapter. Firstly, for those of you who love to study the book of Revelation. Just something I quickly want to draw your attention to. You get to Revelation 19. There's the battle of Armageddon where Antichrist and the military forces of the world try to take on Jesus as he returns to the earth at the second coming. And it sounds on the surface, even to us believers, right? It sounds absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Because we think, really? Really? The world is going to try and take on a supernatural God with natural weapons and soldiers? That, that, that's insanity. And yet it will not be an event without precedent. For here in Exodus 14, we see Pharaoh and the armies of Egypt doing the exact same thing. Do not forget what they have already seen. Just as the world will have seen the supernatural power of God through the tribulation and the judgments, Egypt had seen the ten plagues. There was no question they had experienced directly the judgment and power of God. They knew they were not fighting the Israelis. They were fighting against God. And when they reach the Israelites in this chapter, the presence of God is there. It's a visible pillar of cloud and fire. And the Egyptians still try to fight with God. Why? Because their hearts had been hardened by the Lord. Because they refused to believe, God made them unable to believe. And I suspect a similar dynamic will be at work in the lead up to the battle of Armageddon and the tribulation. Secondly, got to point this out. One of the most tabloid-esque Christian news stories that has been coming around for decades and refuses to die, goes like this. Article headline. Egyptian chariots found at the bottom of the Red Sea. Most of you, almost all of you probably have had an email forwarded to you or a Facebook post somebody shared or a YouTube video. Here's the problem, okay. These stories, they're always accompanied by something like but then the Egyptian authorities showed up and confiscated them. Or, but we didn't have a permit, so we just had to leave them there. Or, we had them, but then they mysteriously disappeared. And as I mentioned, the biblical account does not have the Israelites crossing the Gulf of Aqaba. And these types of stories usually claim that those artifacts were found in the Red Sea close to the Gulf of Aqaba. 
But if a person ever actually did have a chariot wheel from an Egyptian chariot that was found far north in the Gulf of Suez, then they should be doing what any serious academic would do, which is turning it over to be examined by professionals who've literally and tragically dedicated their entire lives to that sort of thing. Egyptian chariot wheels changed in style over the years. So, so like if, you know, say the world's around 100 years from now and, and somebody finds a rim and they're like, this rim seems unusually large and, and even though the rim is stationary, you'll notice that it's still spinning. We would go, oh yes, that was from a very terrible era in car design in the late 20th century. That was a really big thing back then. So they can do the same sort of thing with Egyptian uh, chariot wheels. They can date them to a specific time period and dynasty. And so if anyone ever found one, we'd be able to date it to an exact amount of time. And so as Christians, we need to understand that it's not an effective apologetic tactic to share tabloid grade information that hasn't been peer reviewed, that hasn't been academically verified. We have to do better than that. And, and there's a reason why there's never been a time where this person has actually submitted the evidence to be examined by professionals. Because if they had, there would be an academic paper printed about it. It wouldn't just be their blog post saying, I had this reviewed by the best Egyptian wagon wheel reviewer in the world, and he said it's definitely legit. There's going to be an actual peer-reviewed academic document on this. And so if that doesn't exist, please discard it. And if someone says, isn't this amazing? I mean, you can just smile and say, that's great because you're probably all more non-confrontational than I am. But you shouldn't forward it, shouldn't pass it on to anyone because it's just not true. It's just not true. So why did God allow Israel to get into this situation? Why, did, why does he allow this to happen in the first place? I think firstly, so that he could display his power and show them who he is. Why did he want to do that? Because as we learned the situation revealed they didn't yet believe him. They believed in him, but they did not yet believe him. But then finally as well, the Lord put them in this difficult situation because it says he wanted to make himself known to the Egyptians. Just like he did through the plagues. He wanted the Egyptians to know who he was. And so here's what that means. It means in your life and in my life, there will be times where we may be put into a difficult situation so that our life can be a testimony or a witness to somebody else. What? You mean I, I just might suffer or go through hardship so somebody else can benefit? Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. Because other people are paying attention. They're paying attention. You have no idea when you're going through a difficult situation, especially one that other people know about. You have no idea who else is going to go through that situation and remember watching you go through it. I say, no, but I, re I remember. They were still at church every week. They were still taking communion. They were still lifting their hands and blessing the Lord every week. And so how can I stay at home and throw myself a pity party? How can I isolate myself? They already did it. God will use the difficulty that you go through as a witness to someone else. Life gets difficult. Man, do we freak out? like the Israelites? Are we just as quick to revise history? I knew it. I knew this is what would happen if I trusted the Lord. Because if we are, it shows that we want the blessings of God much more than the salvation of God. If the only thing God ever did for you was give you the gift of salvation, do you know that would be reason enough for you to worship him for eternity? If that's all he did, if he's like, I'm going to give you salvation, the rest of your life is going to suck till the day you die should still be here every week in blessing the Lord because he's done more for you than we could ever possibly repay. He saved you from death. He saved your soul from hell. Saved you from a meaningless life. And when we talk as though we're not sure we made the right decision in following the Lord, we're saying, yeah, I know you saved me, Lord, but, but what have you done for me lately? How about this? You're still saved. I'm keeping you saved today and I'll keep you saved tomorrow. Every single moment of your life, of my life, we're not saved because we made a decision all those years ago. We're saved today because God is keeping us saved. Because if there was any way we could lose our salvation, we would. If there was any way we could mess this thing up, we would. So praise God for keeping you saved right now if you can't think of anything else to thank him for. And may the Lord forgive us if we've ever thought in a wrong way about this. If we've ever forgotten just what it cost Jesus to save us. 
And so if you're feeling sorry for yourself, if you're having a pity party, take communion. Eat of the body, drink of the blood of Jesus, and remember what he's done for you. And say thank you. you got something to thank him for. And then lastly, back in verse 13, Moses told the Israelites, The Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. You know this by now. Egypt is a picture of the world. Pharaoh is a picture of Satan. The slavery of the Israelites in Egypt is a picture of the bondage to sin and death that you and I are born into. When we're saved, we're released from Egypt. We're freed from that bondage to sin and death. And here's what we need to know. If Satan comes chasing after us, with all his chariots reminding us of our sins, we see God's response reflected in how he responded to the Egyptians. Our sins have been washed away. And when Satan attempts to remind us and condemn us of our past sins, we need to remember that those sins have been washed away. They are washed away by what? By the blood of Jesus. As Paul wrote in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The old you, the old me, the part that was full of sin, that person's dead. He's washing up on the shore of the lake right there. We're on the other side. We've passed through the waters. We've been saved. And to make sure that we never forget that, again, the Lord gave us communion. He gave us communion. And then lastly, I just want to challenge you. I know you believe in God, but do you believe God in in your life? The things his word says, do you believe him? Do you believe him? Or do you think... You know, I think that's true for most people, but but maybe not for me, maybe not for my life. You can believe God. You can trust him. I would encourage you to choose to trust him right now. But even if you don't, here's what I can tell you. He's going to take you on a journey to teach you that you can trust him. Because you can. And if you're struggling to trust him, just begin to remember what he's already done for you. So with that, let's pray. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Father, thank you so much for the promises of your word. Thank you for the security of your word. Thank you that we get a picture of a God who did everything to deliver his people, just as you did everything to deliver us. Lord, we're here today not because of anything we've done. We're here today because all we did was say thank you to the gift that you gave us. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for adopting us into your family. Father, every single one of us, whether we realize it or not, we have all at one time or another stood still and seen the power of God at work in our lives. Because when we were dead, you made us alive in Christ, Lord. When we had absolutely nothing to offer, just as we still have nothing to offer, you moved in a miraculous way and put us in your family forever. Thank you for doing that, Lord. Father, I pray for every single one of us, would you just highlight the one thing that you really want us to hear from your word this evening. By the power of your spirit, would you just shine a light on it right now in every heart that we would hear your word for us through your spirit, Jesus. And then help us to respond in the way that you want us to, Lord. 